Hey all, it's Takuya here, and before things begin, I want you to make sure to click the link down in the description below in order to check out the History of Everything podcast. Yes, this is the History of Everything podcast YouTube channel, but all of this is based off the History of Everything podcast, which my wife and I put on together. So, please check it out, subscribe, and I hope you enjoy the video. If someone asks you to march hundreds of miles deep into enemy territory with dwindling supplies through the thickest of jungles and the driest of desert, would you trust them? Would you fight harder to win for them? Would you grow to love them as a wise leader no matter what it is that you had to actually go through? Well, let's see how an international force of hundreds of elite soldiers followed their leader to hell and back. This is the story of the Chindits. Now, the Chindits occupy a rather interesting place in the Hall's military history. But in order to understand them, we first have to break down and understand their leader and founder. I mean, there are plenty of stories from World War I and World War II that start with a rather eccentric British officer ordering his men to do something that is, well, rather insane. And for this story, that is Brigadier General Charles Ord Wingate. Now, I'm going to say this right now, but Wingate was pretty much a madman. There's actually one of these stories where one of his soldiers fondly recalled how Wingate once came home into the mess tent for dinner wearing only underwear, boots, and an alarm clock that was around his neck holding his trusty fly swatter that he would rarely be found without. Which, if he was a big guy, that would probably be something. But Wingate wasn't necessarily a physically impressive man. He stood at medium height, he was fairly thin with dark eyes, and when he went on expeditions, he tended to grow a rather scraggly beard. He was once, in fact, referred to as terribly, terribly scruffy, which sounds like an absolutely horrible insult to a British officer at the time. You know, for gentlemanly warfare, that's not something that you want to be. But rather than a gentleman, Wingate was instead more of a maverick and a loose cannon. He had a tendency to go against orders when he, you know, felt that it was going to be necessary. He gained a reputation for being loved by his men and absolutely hated by the upper echelons of leadership. But I mean, I guess that is what happens when you get a reputation for being aggressive and argumentative. But more important than anything with your reputation, what was important is that Wingate got results. He got things done. His story got started in 1923 when he received his officer's commission. His father's cousin, Sir Reginald Wingate, was a retired general who had significant sway in the realm of the British military circles. Now, this connection served him well, and when he got permission for six months of leave in 1927, it was to see if it was possible to mount an expedition into Sedan. His goal at the time was to support the Sedan Defense Force there and be allowed secondment. Now, secondment is a term that you may not recognize, but what it basically is, is when one country is allowed to lend military forces or personnel to help another country's military for reasons. There's any number of ways in which it can actually happen. But before his position and secondment was actually confirmed in the first place, Wingate instead decided to send all of his stuff ahead of him and just start going down to Sedan anyway. Like he was putting the cart way before the horse. The man hopped onto a bicycle, he rode through France, through Germany, Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Yugoslavia, all the way until he arrived in Genoa, Italy. Now, by this point, I can only imagine that his calf muscles would have been massive. Wingate then took a boat on over to Egypt and just went on his way over to Sudan. He really believed in himself, which I guess is a good thing then that it actually worked out. Because once in Sudan, he did get approved for secondment, and Wingate spent almost six years there before reaching the rank of Bimbashi or what we would consider a major in most modern Western militaries. His troops loved him, even though he pushed their endurance to its limits by having them march on long expeditions through the desert, at the time subsisting only on limited water, biscuits, dates, oranges, and cod liver oil. You see, it was here that Wingate really developed his own personal philosophy of you needed to push yourself and your body to its utmost physical and mental limits. Only then could you truly make yourself stronger. And it was also here that he began to develop his tactics of long-range penetration, which, no, don't look at me like that, I know exactly what you're thinking, but no, we're going to be getting into that later to explain. Control yourself. The reason why he was able to push his men so incredibly hard was that he was not going to ask his men to do anything that he personally was not willing to do. In working alongside his men, he earned their loyalty and respect, much in the same way as you would expect from any good officer nowadays. In other words, he was a badass leader who inspired his men to push themselves further and past their predefined limits in order to become the best fighter that they could possibly be. And he was going to make his men the best. When he was in Sudan, he changed how the local forces would actually fight against poachers, changing over their tactics from simply patrolling to actually going in 
ambushing poachers and slave traders. He was never happier when he was just out in the bush with his men, doing things. Wait, that sounds wrong. But regardless, he was happy when he was out in the field. He was a man of action. And when it came to that action, he was a man who got results. Over time, he would help the Sudan Defense Force and British-controlled Sudan to become experts in unconventional warfare, which would later serve them well in the mid to late 1930s. In 1936, he was assigned to the British Mandate of Palestine, where he became an intelligence officer. While there, he would coordinate with local forces and train with them in guerrilla tactics in order to teach them how to fight against the Arabs that were trying to take over the area. While he was there, he actually became a Zionist and came to be an ardent supporter of Zionist Jews for control of the Palestine area. When asked later, the future founders of the Israeli Defense Force, Zvi Brenner and Moshe Dayan, they stated that Wingate taught us everything we know. He became so loyal and committed to the Zionist cause that he was actually considered at one point to be compromised as an intelligence officer and reassigned, as it was actually considered that he was too biased in favor of the Jewish state or of forming the Jewish state. But of course, while all of this is happening, in 1935, Benito Mussolini, the Italian fascist dictator, would go on to attack Ethiopia and in 1936 would fully annex it. Wingate was tasked with helping Emperor Haile Selassie to take back his country, and Wingate immediately set about training and organizing his troops available to him in order to turn them into an elite fighting force. This force actually proved remarkably effective against driving the Italians out, and by 1941, Wingate was personally accompanying the emperor back to the capital city of Addis Ababa in victory. And it was at this time that a report was sent to the British High Command, and Wingate actually gained the attention and support of Sir Winston Churchill himself. Basically, at this point, Churchill pulled an emperor Palpatine and was like, we will watch your career with great interest. Wow, actually, my voice with being sick actually sounds remarkably good for that. Do it. Okay, but that's enough of that. With friends like these, who needs enemies? Okay, Ord Wingate does. Shortly after, Wingate was promoted to Major General. Now, I know what you're probably saying. Stack, you've spent this entire time talking about one guy. What about the Chindits? What about the title of this video? Like, wh where is all of that going to come in? Well, in March of 1942, Wingate was sent to Burma, which is now known as Myanmar, and that was to help stop the rampaging onslaught of the Japanese forces that were running over Southeast Asia. The Japanese had just taken over Singapore in one of the British Empire's most embarrassing losses, and they were desperate to learn how to fight in the jungle as they were pushed all the way back into Burma. It was at this time that he was given command of the 77th Infantry Brigade, which he nicknamed the Chindits which he actually took inspiration from something called the Chinta, which is a Buddhist mythological creature that would guard the gates to Buddhist temples there in Burma. Wingate immediately set out to train these men in varying types of warfare, survival, and guerrilla tactics. His men consisted roughly of around half British troops, with the other half being comprised of Burmese riflemen and Nepali Gurkhas, which, honestly, I can do an entire podcast episode about the Gurkhas. I probably need to do one of those here in the future. Every chindit was required to carry at least 70 pounds while they marked, along with four days of rations that were comprised of a specific set of diet foods that Wingate himself had personally designed for their marches. In this way, he would be able to ensure maximum nutrition. Each man was prepared to live up to three months inside the jungle. Everything else was to be carried by a series of mules that were imported from Missouri, which, you know, they are very known to be very, very stubborn indeed. They in fact used over a thousand mules over the course of their initial mission, with that mission being to infiltrate deep behind Japanese lines and destroy the railroads and other supply networks that were keeping the Japanese troops supplied at the front line. This was the first time that anything like this had been done in modern jungle combat. I mean, chopping through thick bamboo forests was difficult, and navigating through the jungle was especially difficult as the tree canopies made it hard to use the sun and stars for navigation. You didn't really have any kind of reference, and the lack of landmarks made any significant movement in any direction very hard. I mean, you try pushing a mule uphill through mud that has been made muddy because it's in the middle of monsoon season. It ain't exactly easy. Sometimes in areas where the vegetation was particularly thick or the rain was particularly bad, you'd get areas where your progress was going to be measured in under 100 yards per hour. It was pretty slow progress. For further supplies, they were supposed to be resupplied by airdrops, and the railroad that they were to destroy was around 200 miles behind enemy lines. As they planned their mission, 
it was supposed to be a three-pronged attack, codenamed Operation Longclaw, with other forces helping the Chindits by distracting and harassing the Japanese. But despite the fact that it was supposed to be a three-pronged attack, at the last second the other two units were not able to actually make the mission. So, Wingate decided to pursue ahead alone. And again, Wingate would prove to be very eccentric to his observers. He would regularly pass out orders while showering, wearing only a shower cap and continuing to clean himself with a scrub brush. He wore garlic and onions around his neck in order to ward off insects, and would commonly be seen eating said onions raw, like an apple. And while weird, he was tough, and his men were going to have to be as well. Because unfortunately for them, in order to reach their objective, they had to go well beyond the range that their supply drops were actually able to reach thus meaning that they would have to survive off the land. Now, in a jungle, that could be fairly difficult, as when you are in a jungle with dirty water sources or things that are able to make you sick at the mere drop or prick of a finger, then you are talking about an environment in which any kind of infection or anything can simply just kill you or incapacitate you. In fact, over the course of the early years of fighting in Burma, 10 times the number of casualties came from disease than they did from any kind of combat-related injury. But his men persevered. They crossed the river Chindwin, and Wingate then split his forces into eight columns, sneaking past the Japanese front line and deep into the jungle. Now, his philosophy on jungle infiltration was march divided, fight united. They made it to the railroad, and without being detected, they cut the rails in more than 75 different places. Once the sabotage was complete, the Japanese naturally were on high alert, and they started an intense search of operations through the jungle in order to try to find the Chindits. Seeing what was happening, they also began to intercept the airdrops that were resupplying the brigade, thus forcing them to retreat even faster than they had initially planned. It was going to be a mad dash to safety over the course of hundreds of miles with literally nothing in the ways of supplies or food. And now, because they were being constantly chased by the Japanese, they simply could not slow down much. So when men were simply too weak or injured to actually move on, and they were forced to be left behind. Now, this is antithetical to what almost every modern soldier is taught. No man left behind is a very common sentiment that is shared amongst almost all modern militaries. In fact, I cannot even think of one off the top of my head right now that that is not a thing for. It was noted by the survivors that having to end the lives of their fellow compatriots was something that traumatized them. Understanding the situation, these sick or injured men knew that they would now be left to hope that the Japanese wouldn't simply execute them, or worse, take them to a POW camp. The horrors of those camps were well known to the men. Many of them refusing to let themselves succumb to this fate would instead request morphine, followed by a gunshot to the head of one of their comrades. The ones too sick to know what happened to them were usually just shot on the spot as a kind of mercy, and then buried immediately. Still, Wingate inspired his men to carry on, and by mid-1943 they had actually reached the Irrawaddy River. Even though the Japanese were coming up the banks of the river to stop him, he and his men split into two groups, crossed, and made it back to safety in India. Of the 3,000 men who stepped off for the mission at the start, 818 of the original force were killed in action. They were taken prisoner by the enemy or simply died from disease on the way. Of the 2,182 men who returned, malaria took the lives of over 700 men over the course of the next 12 months. And out of those left remaining, only 600 would ever be considered fit to return to combat duty. Operation Longcloth had pushed them to their limits, the very limits of the human experience, and the unit would go on to be resupplied with new troops and set up to take part in Operation Thursday. During the preparation for that mission, Wingate was actually en route by plane to coordinate with leaders to discuss the operation when his plane simply never made it. Whether it had been shot down or taken over by some force of nature, we don't know. But what had happened was that the Chindits lost their leader. Yet, the Chindits would carry on, and they would go on to help to drive the Japanese out of Burma towards the end of World War II. In the end, the Chindits showed what could be done with jungle warfare and greatly influenced the development of unconventional warfare, training local troops, strategic planning, and survival principles, all of which are still studied and taught to this day by special operation forces around the world. And it all started with a crazy, tough lunatic by the name of Ord Wingate. Thank you very much for watching. Please make sure to like, to comment, to subscribe, hit the bell button for notifications, and please make sure to continue to support this channel. I look forward to seeing you all here next time, and I hope that you all have a good rest of your day. Goodbye, guys.